Okay, once again, good afternoon. Uh, we may start with the third lecture, but first of all, let me just briefly sum up the second lecture related to economic indicators and answer the question that we got. Uh, that's the main reason why I want to sum up. So, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, as you saw, economic indicators and gender indicators, they are necessary tool for gender economics. It's impossible to do any kind of analysis without uh, gender indicators and gender indexes. That's why I decided to immediately after explaining what is gender economics to deal with those indicators and to explain a little bit more the main uh, gender indexes because they are really essential for uh, gender economics and also uh, for other social sciences. Uh, <clears throat> And you saw that on a specific example on a gender pay gap. We wouldn't be even able to, to measure or identify gender pay gap without gender indicators or indexes. And now <clears throat> we have one question left. Uh, why do you think some people believe that such gap, gender pay gap, is just a choice in employment, even with all economic statistics? Uh, honestly, this is a really good question. And uh, I have... In, within a presentation, I, I quoted some articles, and one of them uh, from the previous year uh, was published, and the main explanation... Uh, can you hear anything? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, now it's better. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to start from the beginning. Uh, okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, uh, now it's time to start with the third lecture, but before that, I'm just going to briefly sum up the second lecture and answer the question that we got. Okay. Uh, first of all, as you saw, economic and gender indicators, they are essential for gender economics. We, it's impossible to do any kind of analysis uh, without indicators and, and gender indexes. That's why I decided to, to deal with indexes immediately after providing the definition of gender economics. And you saw uh, that how they are relevant and important, those gender indexes uh, uh, on a specific issue of gender pay gap. And all other issues, basically, that we are dealing with uh, within gender economics, uh, uh, it's necessary to use and rely upon uh, gender indicators and gender indexes. That's why they are, they are, they are still developing, uh, but even in this stage, they are, they are essential and really important and relevant not only for gender economics, but also for other social sciences. And now I, I may answer the question we got. Why do, uh, why do you think some people still believe that such gap is just a choice uh, in employment, even with all economic, economic statistics? Uh, well, this is a really good question. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, I quoted an article from the, from the previous year uh, published in a, in a prestige journal, and they claim that uh, exactly that, that the gender pay gap is caused by choices of women to do less paid jobs or, or, or not to do something or, or uh, to occupy some positions that are not so well paid. Uh, that could be part of explanation, but honestly, I don't know how. It goes beyond my imagination to, to understand uh, those those uh, statements and those arguments, honestly, especially when we have statistics, as you mentioned, and, and we analyzed all different reasons behind gender pay gap, and evidently uh, we have a significant problem. Uh, but, you know, some people... Uh, just uh, ignore those problems. We also have people ignoring gender economics and gender studies at all. So that's not something new, but I think that the only way to deal with those people and to prove they are wrong is to do your job and, and make small but significant improvements in your respected fields, uh, whether that's gender economics or law or sociology. In my opinion, that's that's the way, that's that's the best way to deal with those people and to explain that they are wrong by by improving the existing system and by by <clears throat> by dealing with and promoting gender studies. So that that would be my answer. So if you do not have uh, any, okay, we have a hand. Go ahead, Varya, please. Uh, yes, can you hear me? 
Uh, yes, of course. Okay, great. Uh, I have a short question, but I'm not sure if I should pose it now or maybe wait until you finish your third uh, lecture. Yeah, you may ask now, please. It's um, considering this relation between discrimination and the gender pay gap. Um, it was really interesting to me, and I think uh, that point was the key. And I'm just curious, do we have any data, or if not data, then any general idea uh, about the ratio between those two types of gender pay gap? Because if we have, like, for example, I don't know, 20% of um, uh, the gender pay gap uh, in, as you said, the United States or uh, any other country, it would be so easy for that, say, for that state to, to just say, uh, okay, yeah, we do have that gender pay gap, but we are not tackling this issue of the discrimination. And if it is the other way around, it would be a greater problem, if you uh, understood my question. Yeah, thank you. It's a, thank you. It's a, it's a tricky one, uh, but it, it's a good question. Uh, just just to try to to rephrase it. So you think that uh, basically, if there are countries with a with a significant gender pay gap, they may claim that that is not caused by discrimination, but by differences in productivity, and it's a legitimate choice, right? Yes, exactly. And they can just justify in that way and use it as a let's say, facade for uh, the, the problem of discrimination, which is the root problem of that uh, pay gap, which then plays the role of a consequence rather than a problem itself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we understood each other, and, and I think that's, that's a possibility. Uh, but still, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, uh, it's really hard to do that because because of the data and indicators and indexes that we have. It, it is really hard to, to present that as a consequence of uh, different productivity and so on. Uh, so uh, in essence, that's why it's important to have uh, this adjusted pay gap or corrected or specified pay gap. We were uh, talking about this term, so when you specified or correct or adjust the gender pay gap, you take into account all those different factors, level of education, uh, uh, human capital experience and so on. And then there is no room left for, for anything else except discrimination. If, uh, if you include all those factors, if you consider all those factors and still you have gender pay gap, then the only possible explanation would be discrimination against women. So, but still, we are still developing those indexes and, and, and indicators. And as I mentioned, so far, we, we managed to calculate uh, unadjusted or raw uh, gender pay gaps. Uh, so we just were able to calculate average wage of women and men and to compare those values. But still, even in, in those cases when, when uh, scientists calculated, adjusted or corrected that pay gap for all those differences in, in productivity and level of education and so on, uh, they, they spotted a, a significant difference between average uh, pay of or average wage of men and women. Um, and, and that implicitly indicates, of course, those are indicators, so we cannot claim, but that indicates uh, uh, discrimination against women as a main uh, reason behind gender pay gap. And also, uh, there are other ways to prove uh, that and to prove that we need to, to eliminate gender pay gap based on discrimination is that, uh, as I mentioned, we may compare different countries. And it's interesting that those countries that uh, have lower or have managed to reduce the gender pay gap, they, they have better economic performances. And as I mentioned, that study of European Institute for Gender Equality, they, they calculated that uh, countries that reduce the gender pay gap managed to increase their GDP per capita to, to 3%, which is really significant. So yes, we are still developing this field. We are still developing those indicators. But I think even this first step is, is really significant to be aware of the problem and to to start to deal with those problems so but but yes we cannot say with certainty uh, this is caused by productivity or discrimination as you saw that example that we were using uh, professor Vyadinovich mentioned it's really hard to distinguish between discrimination and, and productivity uh, but still in those cases when we are certain that discrimination is the reason behind gender pay gap 
in those cases we definitely should eliminate that gender pay gap and i think that there is a room for improvement when it comes to our labor law we mentioned maternity leave there are also other legal institutes that could be improved in a way to to eliminate possibilities for to to for discrimination against women and to decrease gender pay gap thank you you're welcome we have also question nina please go ahead yeah sorry maybe it was for the first lecture just just a brief comment uh in regard to all the challenges in recognizing the gender pay gap and for even first the cause of the gender pay gap just one more practical challenge refers to the fact that often in private companies uh, the salaries are defined as confidential information in the employment contract so that is just like besides of course all, all the mention which is which are the root causes this is also often a challenge in practice which uh, completely like it's a first step in order to even recognize the existence of the gender pay gap and really a practical challenge that we should also have have in mind. So just a brief comment in that regard. Uh, yeah, Mina, thank you so much for this comment and you are totally right. And for example, I'm just going to mention that uh, I also wrote and published an article about gender pay gap within the Law and Gender Project published by, by Springer. And I was shocked in a way that we didn't have the data in Serbia, basically, we didn't calculate the gender pay gap. So I, I literally took the data from the statistical office uh, for salaries for men and women and calculated average wages and, and established that there is a huge difference, 14.5%, a uh, little bit higher than, than European average. So, you know, in some cases we have the data, but we are refusing to, to use those data and to, to, to deal with the problem. But also that's, that's a problem in private practice, but still we have the data on a macro level because all those private firms, they have to report, they have to pay taxes and fees. And our statistical office, statistical office of the Republic of Serbia, they have those data on a macro level. So we may, uh, uh, I would say, uh, avoid that problem, but still when you are dealing with a specific industry or a specific firm, yes, that, that could be a problem and, and it could be a clash with other fields of law like privacy and, and their right to to, to basically to, to keep those data uh, uh, private. Uh, and yes, that, that's a problem. But also uh, what is a, a new trend, I would say, in, in when it comes to private companies, they also, uh, they are becoming aware of gender sensitive issues and, and they, are, they, they want to make everything transparent uh, because of those findings and because they don't want to be on a blacklist uh, like, like some firm that is uh, promoting gender inequality and, and gender pay gap. So, yeah, this this could be a, a brief comment on, on answer to your question, but it, it is a really good question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, if we do not have uh, other questions related to gender pay gap, we may continue with the third lecture and also with a discussion. So if you have some questions related either to, to gender pay gap or, or any other field or gender economics in general, feel free to ask during uh, this lecture, third lecture. And now the idea is to, to explain some specific issues, to deal with some specific issues and uh, uh, related to, just a sec, related to uh, gender innovation and entrepreneurship. And also, those issues are, 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 I would say, quite new uh, in, 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 in gender economics and they're still developing. So I would like to, to know what is your opinion on, on, on those, those issues, uh, gender innovation and entrepreneurship. Just some basic, f basic uh, facts and then we may, we may discuss about these issues. So first of all, I'm not sure you should, whether you may see the presentation. You should be able to see it now. Okay, so gender equality, we mentioned it is, it is, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Just to check. Okay, everything is fine. We may continue with innovation. And gender equality, discrimination against women, once again, discrimination and gender inequality also affects uh, uh, 
research and development activities and innovation. So that's also a significant aspect uh, when it comes to equality and economic performance. Why innovation is so important when it comes to economics? Well, uh, I already mentioned economics, is it's all about scarce resources. All the resources that we have, they are limited, except innovation. You know, innovation is <laughs> the only unlimited source of economic growth. And in the 21st century, that's why we all have those public policies promoting innovation, incentivizing research and development activities, because innovation is basically the only unlimited source of economic growth. By innovating, you may increase productivity, and for the same amount of resources, you may have better economic uh, outcome. So that's why innovation is really important, and it's really important to use all the resources available to promote and increase innovation. And when it comes to gender parity and innovation, uh, gender inequality creates significant gender disparity in science, technology, and innovation. That's a, not something new, but we're going to explain in detail. And for example, it's interesting to mention that in 2019, women were named uh, only in 13.2% of all patent applications. So, uh, all the patent applications in this is uh, the data for European patent organizations. So in Europe, only 13% were submitted uh, or signed by by women, and less than one in seven inventors in Europe are women. And this is also European Patent Office study. So they have exact data. There's no doubt about that. So uh, we may talk about that. What is the reason? Why do we have less women inventors compared to men? Only one in seven inventors in Europe are women. I'm just going to present some of the data and then I'm going to ask you to answer the question why. Uh, why do we have less women uh, innovators? Okay, this is also official data and you may see a, a, a share of women inventors in patent applications. So this is a publication year of patent application and share of women inventors. So you may see 2004, approximately 12%. Uh, 2018, almost 17% and so on. So since 2004 till today, uh, we, we, this is also for, for European Patent Office, uh, we have uh, significantly less women inventors compared to men. Their share is somewhere between uh, 10% and 20%. Uh, so, okay, I see a hand. So just a second to, to finish with this graph and the following graph, and then we may uh, have a discussion. So the point is just to present the data to see that we have significantly less women in, in science and innovation than men. And it's getting even more complicated if you observe those data uh, for example, it depends on a specific industry. In chemistry, we have more women inventors than, for example, in uh, electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. It's also important to emphasize that at the universities, we have more women inventors than business companies and individual inventors. So obviously it depends on the environment and incentives and regulation. Uh, but, you know, this is a general picture and this is a specific picture based on different industries and, and different uh, employers. So that's also relevant. And uh, it is interesting to see that, for example, those are uh, representative samples. Uh, those are countries, Germany, France and UK in European Union. And when it comes to employment, we were talking about that. Uh, they have 40% share, almost 50% of women uh, compared to compared to men, uh, to, that's participation in the total workforce, but still only 10% of women inventors, or 15%, uh, or in UK 12% or so. So definitely we have, we saw that we do not have discrimination against women during education. They have access to primary and secondary education. They have access to labor market, but suddenly we have a short. Uh, we have a short decrease, uh, significant decrease when it comes to women inventors. Okay, now why? Why is that so? We had a, a hand. Now you may ask a question and then also we have here in the room people uh, that will ask questions. Okay, yeah, go ahead. You'll be so. 
Uh, your question is very easy. The women in the society are too occupied with the family. Everything what you say is true. Uh, chemistry, you can have house labor, uh, laboratory. Uh, there is one lady. She was first in management, and she has good business. But when she wants to invent something, she must give a quit. And when uh, she's done something with the games, but when her ask, uh, when they ask her what is the reason for her success, she says, uh, charge reason is that she uh, she was with the family. In the same time, she's helping herself but and and that's real reason i know that we all expecting like the women is going to be like Marianne Curie or something like that but it's not easy i when i go to, to work i can stay one guy won't on the job why because my uh my wife she's with the children so, so I have time for myself, for in waiting, for everything, but that's something what I can't say for her. Okay, uh, just a sec to check whether I'm muted. Can you hear me now? I finished. Okay, you can hear me. I'm muted. Oh, okay, now I see. Okay, uh, thank you once again for, for this explanation. Uh, I would partially agree, uh, but in general, in, in economics, uh, we refrain from answers based on a personal example or, or you know, you have to have a representative sample, something that is called representative sample, that is statistically significant a result, but still some kind of intuition, in, like you mentioned, it could be really extremely useful. So I, I partially agree with you. And now we have... The other question uh, from the audience here in the room. Please go ahead. What do you think? Why, why do we have less women inventors compared to men? Well, there are many reasons, but one of them could be just the way women are brought up. I mean, uh, growing up, we are exposed to many male inventors, the, the stories of all the scientists and the history, etc. So, uh, of course, that's not the whole reason, but sometimes it's just the, uh, the idea that it's not the path a woman should take. So they are not empowered enough to try and succeed in that field because they, are, they do not have the same validity there, they are not regarded with the same respect. In some cases, that's not always the case. I mean, there are certain situations where women are regarded as of same worth or even more, and where these problems do not exist. But where they are present, it's largely due to the experience that most inventions which we uh, now mention, the telephone, the, uh, I don't know, uh, electricity, whatever, I mean, everything around us, we uh, connect it to some men and not women, so maybe that's part of the reason, but also what the colleague said, and I'm sure someone else is going to mention something else, so, so I'll, I'll stop here. Also, one question, can you get the presentation to the full screen, because we can see anything from here. <laughs> okay, just a sec, I'm, I'm going to try to do that. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah, yes. Okay, now it's better, okay, thank you so much for this. And for your answer, I, I would agree with you, and I would qualify that as a part of tradition or culture uh, that is present in, in many European countries. And also we may find a correlation between those countries that do not have such kind of tradition, like United States, where we have more women inventors compared to Europe or even Africa or Asia, when, where, where they have such, such a tradition, like simply women do not uh, take that that part and do not uh, basically they do not even try to to, to invent something unfortunately and uh, they are also discriminated within educational system and and within uh, institutes and other other in other fields where where they are supposed to invent something so that also could be a part of problem so once again, again <laughs> discrimination is is a is a is a really uh, abstract term but but in my opinion it's it's a part of the answer because we are discriminating women and all those fields that we mentioned uh, jointly uh, education uh, 
pay gap, uh, uh, participation in the labor market, maternity leave, uh, uh, taking care of family, like Lubisov mentioned, all those factors together, I think that they affect in innovation and uh, women innovators. And that's why we have the, the low numbers here, or only 10% or 15% of women, because all those facts basically affect uh, or influence women not to invent. And that's why I, I guess they, they all jointly uh, basically uh, uh, are, are, um, may explain the figures that we have. Okay, I, I see another question. Varya, go ahead. Yes, uh, I would agree that this is some kind of a social context, uh, if we call it cultural, traditional, or whatever. And I would just quickly uh, address the issue that Sophia mentioned, the fact that um, all of the innovations that are uh, around us um, are, um, let's say, brought up or made by men. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask if someone knows the story of uh, Hedy Lamar. I'm not sure if anyone is um knows the story but this is a woman who invented this mechanism of uh, frequencies uh that is now used in bluetooth and uh, wi-fi communication and in that period it was used for the secret communication for the ship uh, ships of the u.s navy and uh, in that period, she did not get a patent for her invention. Um, and it was, um, in a sense, stolen from her. And for her life, she uh, didn't get a penny uh, for the, the invention she had. So I just wanted to uh, point out that even though there are some women uh, inventors, they're usually oppressed. And in that way, uh, we cannot, it is not, uh, let's say, if we shouldn't be... Um, so questioning, not questioning, but it shouldn't be strange for us um, that uh, we cannot hear from any women inventors if we take into account the way they were treated when, in fact, they made a significant uh, invention in some sphere. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for this explanation. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, but also, in general, I, I would like to add that this indicator of women inventors in my opinion, it will become less and less significant in the future because now we are facing a, a completely new trends in innovation and the majority of innovation basically uh, occurs within uh, employment organizations or is financed by the employer and protected by, by an employer. Uh, so basically employees... Uh, male or female, basically they, they contribute to those inventions, but inventions are so specific and so sophisticated that they cannot be basically invented by one person and also they are in a way commercialized by and protected by, by an employer. So in the future, I'm afraid that we will not be able to, to follow those data and, and see how many men and women we have uh, within uh, those patent applications because majority of applications already is submitted by, by employers or, or uh, legal persons. So basically you may indicate uh, innovators uh, within the applications, but basically they are, they are uh, patent owner is, is uh, an employer. So that's also a significant shift that we'll have in the future in this field of research and development and innovation. But definitely this indicates that women are not treated equally within uh, employers' organizations, within scientific uh, organizations, uh, within education and all other things that we mentioned. Basically, they reflect uh, women's position uh, in, in, um, in innovation. And that's why uh, I guess we have uh, less women inventors compared to men. Of course, if you have any other comments or questions, you are more than welcome. Yeah, you mentioned some, some women inventors, and those are really good examples. And definitely they were discriminated. So th that's a pure example of discrimination against women. And But once again, discrimination is a really broad term, and we have uh, many, many forms of discrimination, and uh, not treating equally men and women inventors is, is also a specific form of discrimination. And historically, only men were able to submit uh, patent applications, and they were in a form of of uh, of rulers, 
decree or a decision they were basically allowing uh, patents uh, they were uh, granting patents uh, and and but but that's that's a history now now they are equal uh, under the patent law but still we have less women and i'm afraid that's a reflection of of a general position that that women have in in our society and in general in europe and and, and United States. And this is also an example where you may see that those indicators are really important to identify problem and to compare different systems and then to look for an answer. What is the reason behind the problem? And then finally, how to solve the problem. So this is all about economic analysis to use those indicators to identify problem, to compare different system and try to provide an answer and, and solve the problem. So. Just to come back to, to your question about why there are less enter entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs among uh, women, that's, I think, closely related to the issue of uh, work-family balance. You yeah. mentioned on your personal case, uh, which can be generalized in a sense if male entrepreneurs or professors or whoever, workers in the factory, take more share in the family obligations, domestic obligations, than the space for more uh, inclusion of women in the, these jobs is more pr probable. Okay, this is, uh, I, I completely agree, and this is more specific about innovation, and the next issue will be entrepreneurship, but yeah, it's it's very well connected, and yeah, it's it's on, on, on the place. I see a hand here. It's Ubisoft. Do you have another question, please? Okay, I guess not. Uh, then we may go. The hand was up from the last question. So. Okay, maybe yeah, definitely it's a, it's a mistake. Okay, then we may continue with a with a presentation and uh, with innovation and entrepreneurship and yeah basically we we identified some of possible reasons but you may see that this is a, a complex issue and uh, there are no simple answers to, to this question i'm afraid but that's why uh, gender economics and further economic analysis is useful to to identify those problems explain them and and offer uh, offer certain solutions also uh, in, a, in a close relationship with other social sciences, in the first place, law and sociology. Uh, and this is called <laughs> the problem in, in theory that we were discussing right now, uh, leaking pipeline issue, because the problem is that we have a high percentage of women in education and labor market, and suddenly we have uh, uh, not so high percentage of women inventors. And that's explained in literature uh, as a, an analogy, leaking pipeline used to describe the loss of women leaders somewhere along the journey toward their leadership goals. So that's basically, uh, women are, are facing increasing obstacles in, in progress in their scientific and academic careers. And that's, that's a huge problem because at the beginning, if we, if we observe education and participation in labor, labor market, results are relatively good. Of course, we should work on that. We, we were discussing those issues, but still they are relatively good. But when compared with innovation, that's, that's a, a way lower percentage of women compared to men, compared to men. And that's explained in literature uh, with this term, uh, leaking pipeline that somewhere uh, along the journey, women basically uh, uh, facing obstacles. And that could be uh, having your children, uh, taking care of family and maternity leave. And some other authors also explain that there are different uh, pay, uh, gender pay gaps uh, during different uh, periods in, in women's lives. So, for example, in between 30s and, and, and 40s, there is the, the biggest pay gap because uh, that's exactly the period when a majority of women decides to, to have a children and to be devoted to their families, and that's why they are less productive. And it's interesting, historically, uh, the, the biggest pay gap was uh, between 20s and 30s, but we have different trends now. Now, uh, those days, women do not have children. Majority of them do not have children during their, during their 20s. So that's why uh, the gender pay gap is not that uh, uh, 
huge as it was uh, but once again it's uh, it depends on on um, uh, on the age of women and and uh, once again it seems that they are facing some obstacles and and those obstacles uh, basically occur uh, uh, in in this period period when they are deciding to 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 have families and to be devoted to children so that that could be the reason why also additional reason why we have less uh, women innovators and it's not only problem because uh, women have children and take care of family but it's important uh, to emphasize that we do not have adequate legal treatment uh, of of women taking maternity leave and and uh, and pregnancy leave uh, and and that could be also qualified as as discrimination and therefore they are less productive and they they will earn less and we may qualify that as a gender pay gap based on productivity but basically they are less productive because they are discriminated. So that's why I said it's not possible to, to have a clear, to distinguish basically gender pay gap based on discrimination productivity because sometimes uh, productivity is affected by discrimination against women. And that's also the case when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. In general, the, the solution could be to, to reduce gender inequality and disparity and enabling uh, women's economic empowerment. We also have an index for that, uh, but that's easy to say, and it's not so easy to, to, to do that in practice, but still we should uh, basically identify those gender inequalities related to uh, this specific period of life, maternity leave, uh, pregnancy leave, and so on, and try to amend those legal institutes to basically uh, eliminate discrimination against women and make them more, more productive and uh, maxima, enable efficient allocation of, of uh, scarce resources that we have. Okay, this was in general an answer or possible solution but of course if you go into detail and start to analyze this issue you will see that it's not that easy as it seems and it will need some time to to basically to fix this problem and it's almost the same with um, economic uh, women's economic empowerment and and uh, women uh, entrepreneurship so basically uh, there are different measures that that should boost uh, uh, basically women's economic empowerment and uh, uh, productivity, and these are more related to to working conditions, access to labor market, and so on. So this is a specific aspect of of gender inequality to empower, uh, to provide economic empowerment to enable women to to be equal to men uh, in terms of economics. And that's also uh, uh, reflected in, in uh, female or women entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, that's, that's also a hot topic uh, uh, since recently, uh, because we realized that uh, uh, entrepreneurship is, is essential for, for any economy. Uh, those are economic activities uh, that are risk-bearing. They, they imply organization and innovation, and they basically move the whole economy forward, and they increase uh, basically living standard, GDP per capita. So entrepreneurship is, is really, really important for, for any economy. But then when you analyze data in this field, you'll see that we have significantly less women uh, than men in this field. Um, this is uh, the data for Serbia, for example. I took this from Serbian Business uh, Registered Agency, Registers Agency, and you may see the share of women in multi-member company owners, a single member company companies with 100 uh, percent share and women entrepreneurs so only 30 percent of all entrepreneurs are women and that's that's really uh, uh, it seems like a significant problem and among the other reasons uh, the reason for that could be that women are entrepreneurs are not paid during their maternity leave they, they have some social uh, contribution or help I don't know how to call that but definitely it's not a salary uh, like uh, regularly employ em employed women so basically that treatment of women entrepreneurs 
uh, resulted in, in those numbers that we have only 33%, 33% of women entrepreneurs, and that also may significantly uh, affect the economic outcomes and, and GDP per capita, if you like. So all the economic activities, main economic activities rely upon entrepreneurship, and that's why it's really important to use potential that women have when it comes to entrepreneurship. But unfortunately, in Serbia, currently, that's not the case. This is also a specific issue, and we may debate about reasons behind that and try to provide some answers, but I, I guess we'll, we'll, it will take some time to, 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 to understand this issue and to, to change something in, in reality. And uh, there are many, many benefits. I mentioned just some of them, so I don't have to, I may skip this, this uh, slide, but there are many benefits of female entrepreneurship. And currently, obviously, uh, we are not using those benefits. We are not using this potential, and that's a huge problem. It's the same like with uh, women innovators. So basically, in, in, in terms of economics, we are wasting our resources. We are wasting valuable resources, resources, uh, and we have suboptimal location of resources because uh, we do not have gender equality and because we have discrimination against women. And once, uh, 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 also for, for the end of this lecture, uh, I will leave some time for a discussion, but there is also another quote, you all know this, lady, <laughs> uh, but this is actually a really good quote. Uh, she said, women are the largest untapped reservoir of talent in the world. Mm -hmm. So really, there is there is almost unlimited talent, and, and unfortunately, we are not using currently that talent, and that's, that's the problem. And that's all about gender economics, how to use that talent, how to use that potential and not to waste. Uh, resources that we have. So we should pay attention on that and we should pay attention and, and, and realize that without women, without taking care of family, those are all not formally paid jobs, but without those jobs, we, we, we cannot have economy or, or even society, uh, well-developed society. So uh, once again, uh, if, if I have to put in, in one sentence, uh, it's what is gender economics? It's all about how to use those potentials and how to use those scarce resources that we have and we are currently not using because of gender inequality. Okay, thank you once again. And if, if uh, you have any questions related to entrepreneurship, innovation, gender inequality, gender economics, uh, feel free to ask. In general, just to sum up uh, the whole course of gender economics, uh, the idea was to introduce some basic terms to explain what is gender economics, why it's so important and relevant, and uh, to explain at least partially uh, methodology within gender economics and, and indicators and indexes that are necessary for any economic analysis and uh, to explain some, some specific issues based on those general explanations. But once again, this is a quite new field, I would say, with a huge potential for further development. And uh, once again, the, the, the main point is to, 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 to find out, to figure out how to, how to uh, use the scarce resources that we have in a more efficient way and how to use uh, those uh, potentials uh, that, that we are currently, obviously, we are not using because we have gender inequality and we have discrimination against women. And once again, it's important to emphasize this is not about women uh, and we are not helping women here, but we are helping whole society, men, women and children. It's not about women. That's, that's the other, uh, I would say, uh, common uh, uh, misapprehension uh, that we are talking about women here. No, we are talking about whole society. We are talking about whole economy because uh, by protecting women, by providing gender equality, we are providing better society for everyone. Okay, go ahead, please. So you mentioned unpaid work within the family uh, and I think that you should have put much more focus. So you said without that unpaid work, there would be no economy. And that's axiomatic, that's self-understandable. 
but then critical reconsideration of that unpaid work, which contains uh, care for children, care for elder, family members, and also domestic obligations. At first, firstly, should have not been should have been reconsidered from gender perspective, should have not been reduced or identified with female uh, obligations. It must not be. So I am coming again to the issue of, in this respect, but not only in this one, family work fair share. So these unpaid obligations Firstly, they should should have been valued, and secondly, they sh they should have not been linked primarily to women, but reconsidered from the point of family work balance, fair share of family obligations and uh, obligations related to the job, and this family fair share family work fair share. On the other side, so this is another topic uh, which I want to put focus on, and I think that you should have put more focus when you, you, you speak about talents and, and entrepreneurship. So much more uh, uh, will be much more female or women among those who can express their talents within the public economics and entrepreneurship is dependent on this family work fair share. So two very important topics interconnected. And I think extremely important for this your mm -hmm. approach, which is fantastic, but I think with these two dimensions would be even better. Uh I, I fully agree with that, and I have to say that I purposely avoided that issue, but I wanted to mention it, uh, because there is a completely new field, like inequality, we mentioned uh, economics inequality, we also have care economics, and that's a relatively new field. Uh, also, we have overlaps with gender economics, and it's it's amazing how classical economics, like uh, a significant share of our economy, aggregate economy, is based on those activities that are not paid. Without women, without uh, children care and family care, we cannot have a, a healthy economy, obviously, even though those activities are not valued in the market uh, in the, most of the time. Uh, but uh, that's also new field, and it's really hard to quantify uh, those things because they are not valued in the market. So that's why it would be a little bit more complicated to, 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 to debate and it would be a little bit more complicated to provide data and indicators for that. But obviously, that's also a significant and, and developing field. And I hope that a significant part of gender economics. So that, that's why I wanted to mention it. But I think in the future, uh, we'll be dealing more with that issue of unpaid uh, uh, work. Uh, basically, it's a, it's about care, care economics, not only about uh, caring, taking care of children, but all other members of society. That's really important. Okay, so, but but so again, I think that in this context, it, it has to be uh, emphasized that care and family obligations and activities and work balance between them has to be to say the common issue for male and female or all all those who, who or gay partners so the fair share of family obligations that is one dimension of the care economics which you mentioned but there is another one related to care uh, services in the public economy and economics related to services healthcare social care uh, and others. I, it's, so there also uh, the critical reconsideration is important. So the COVID consequences imposed considering of this care, public care, 
economics as very relevant. In a sense, uh, I, I read some sources which uh, uh, were based on empirical data and, sh and intended to show, and I think showed, that importance of the public care uh, jobs, which by rule have been uh, fem female uh, jobs, and that COVID showed how how important, how much more they they are important than those economic activities which have been most often considered as the male dominated or masculine industries uh, and, and uh, jobs. So care economy is much more important than usually or up to the COVID consideration. I, I totally agree and I, I would also add that uh, we should look for gender equality within care economics. So we shouldn't wait for women to provide all the necessary care, yeah, but absolutely. also we should look for gender equality in that field. So as I, as I mentioned, there are many overlaps between those two fields, and that's a really significant part of gender economics and economics in general, because as similar to, to, to economic inequality, I think that we cannot afford anymore to ignore those issues because care is definitely substantial for any society and, and any economy, and we simply cannot ignore anymore those issues. So that's, that's a significant part of, of gender economics and may definitely significantly affect economic outcomes. Uh, do we have any other questions? We have one question uh, related to glass ceiling. Uh, Glass ceiling is a, just to explain briefly, glass ceiling is a specific term uh, related to discrimination against women in, in business in general. Uh, when we have a top management uh, uh, within companies, top management is, is consisted of primary, uh, major, of men, basically. So if you have a majority of, of top management uh, uh, consisted of men, then that's called uh, glass ceiling and it's harder for, for women to enter that, that circle and to basically uh, participate in a decision-making process within those huge companies. And that's why, per definition, they are uh, in a way discriminated and it's harder for them to, to be productive in all other fields. So that, that would be glass ceiling, like obstacles that women are facing when it comes to top management in, 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 in big firms. Okay, do we have any other questions related to gender economics in general or some of those specific issues that we mentioned? For the end, I, I have to say that uh, uh, really this project, Law and Gender and this Spring School is amazing opportunity uh, for me also and I guess for all other participants to, 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 to to broaden our horizons and to learn new things. And I really see a huge potential for, for future uh, master program in, in law and gender, because obviously this is, this is uh, those problems that we are facing uh, will have to deal with those issues. And in my opinion, this is, this is just the beginning. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's uh, this is job for all of us. It's, it's not uh, upon one specific field or a group of scientists or, or anybody else to deal with those issues, but we all as a society, students, teachers, workers, uh, you name it, we all have to deal with uh, gender equality and, and with gender economics at the end of the day, if we want to, to live better and to have a higher living standard. Okay, if we do not have uh, questions, then thank you very much for your attention. It was my pleasure, really, honestly. I enjoyed uh, your questions and comments. Uh, they were really constructive. Thank you once again. Thank you, Professor Wedinovich, for your comments, especially. And uh, I really enjoyed and I hope to see you in the future dealing with gender economics again. Thank you.